Okay, so welcome everyone to the first session of Writing the Impossible Object uh, with Ross McElwine and Shiona Tregaskis. I'm going to read the core description and then their bios and then so we can start. Writing the Impossible Object is a three credit workshop seminar focusing on the creation and writing of theory, fiction, and theory fiction. Aided by our guest speakers, we will chart a novel path through entangled canons of writing from and about ideas, bodies of writing in which theoretical and imaginative forms collapse into one another. Uh, we will emphasize uh, the uncanoni uncanonizable and lud ludic aspects of what has recently been gathered under, under the umbrella of theory fiction, such that we, we may approach matters of gender with an attitude of yes and. Supported by breaks of either a fortnight or a month between sessions to allow participants to write, they will be asked to produce several shorter pieces of writing and one more substantial text over the 10 month the duration of the seminar. And indeed to work in genres in addition to written prose. Podcasts, videos, essay films, long form social media and comics are all possible forms to be explored here. The majority of sessions will begin with, converse, uh, with conversation with guests on their own writing and their advice for young writers. They include uh, Rasana Garistani, who Lemmy, Kea Lado McDowell, and others to be confirmed. These conversations will straddle genres and trouble the distinction between them. We will examine techniques and processes for creating texts spanning from the Renaissance commonplace book to avant-garde plagiarism. In the last hour of each session, we will, we will form smaller groups to give and receive feedback in an environment that fosters risk-taking and an understanding approach to feedback and criticism. The seminar will culminate in a publication featuring the work of course participants who will also be encouraged to create their own publications solo or jointly throughout the seminar. Um, alongside the thought elements of the seminar, there will also be a reading group and occasional readings by participants from their work, as well as asynchronous discussion in a section of the New Center Discord server, especially uh, created specially for the course. And uh, I'm going to read the instructor bios. Uh, Ross McElwine is a is publisher and editor and, possible, and a possible object, a small press that uses web free tools to publish works of fiction, theory, conversation, and poetry. Impossible objects, conversations on AI will feature dialogues on artificial intelligence between Rosa Nagarestani, Benjamin Bratton, Matt Dryhurst, Holly Herndon, Helen Hester, and Nick Cernicek. Ross is also, is also active in numerous DAOs with within the wider Ethereum community. Shiona Tragaskis is an editor at Impossible Object. Her poet poetry and critical writing has been widely published. So yeah, I'll give it over to Ross and Shiona. Yes. Thank you, Alan. Hang on, let me just uh, share my screen. So, hello everybody. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to Writing the Impossible Object. Um, we are Ross and Shauna. Um, as Alan has introduced us, uh, we are editor and publisher at Impossible Object, a small press that uses Web3 tools to publish works of fiction, theory, conversation, and poetry. So, Here's our contact details in case uh, you'd like to get in touch with us uh, regarding anything to do with the press. That's our email address. And if you're not following us on Twitter, there's our Twitter handle. OK, so today um, you're going to hear talks from Ross and me, um, and then we're going to sort of have some group introductions and other bits of um, bits and pieces in housekeeping. But I just want to first talk you through uh, our guests. So from next next session on the 15th of June, we've got Resina Garistani, then Lynn Tillman, Jay Springett, and Amy Island, Kay Alardo McDowell, uh, Linda Stupart, Hugh Lemmy, and last but not least, we're seeing Al Cindy. Uh, yeah, so it's a great lineup and we're extremely excited to hear from all of our speakers. Here's a little um, breakdown of what you can expect from this seminar today. So first, we're going to have a, a talk from, from Ross, followed by my talk. And then we've got something called a pre-break. And you may be <laughs> wondering what a pre-break is. Well, that's the opportunity to sign up to 
well, make sure that you're signed up to Discord and you know where we're going for the final section on uh, the itinerary, which is our group discussion, which is going to take place over, over on Discord. We won't be going there until the very end, so you have plenty of time to make sure that everything is working as expected. Um, but that pre-break is an opportunity to check that, followed by the break when inevitably there'll be some teething problems, someone won't, won't know what's going on, where we're going. We'll stay in the um, in the Zoom meeting room, Ross and I, um, and any 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 issues will resolve them then. Um, so after our break, we will have um, some introductions from all of you, and we will get to know a little bit about who's here. Um, it's um, there's a lot of you, so it, uh, we won't have long to to, to talk. But Alan's going to facilitate that. Um, so just basically a hello from everybody, and then we'll move over to Discord. Um, for more 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 chat about what you can expect from the course um hi so yeah i'm not gonna introduce myself uh, again um because um alan's already introduced me um uh when we were doing a little rehearsal of this section um earlier today which is where we just wanted to introduce to you some of the elements of the course it was relatively tricky to strike a balance between uh, under explaining and over explaining. Um, relatively, you know, there are quite a lot of bits to this course, um, sort of relatively complicated. And uh, we made the decision to under explain by a lot in this specific, um, you know, bit of the session today. Um, so we're really just going to give you a very, very brief version of some of these elements that we wanted to tell you about. Um, and also tell you that they are explained in really exhaustive detail in the course syllabus, which hopefully some of you have had a chance to read already. Um, it's in the in the course folder as um, shared by the new center. Um, but anyway, yeah, let me just tell you a little bit about some of these things. So as Sean has said already, we will have guests. We'll have guest sessions. Um, and the way that these will run is that they'll begin with essentially a kind of conversation format uh, between the guest, Shauna and me. Then there'll be a bit of time for questions and queries from the group. And then for the final hour, we will go over into the Discord server for the, oh, that was meant to sync up with me saying that, breakout groups. So the breakout groups, um, the idea behind these is that <clears throat> although I guess the majority of each of our scheduled sessions will take place on Zoom, where they'll be recorded, et cetera, et cetera. We felt that it was pretty important to create a space which was much more intimate, which wasn't recorded, basically taking place on Discord instead of Zoom, where we can share work, receive feedback, that kind of thing. Um, we express, you know, we give some more details about this in the course syllabus. And we'll probably be talking more about how these breakout groups will work when we go to Discord at the end of the session. Um, this, just to show you, is the bit of the New Centre Discord where we've got a special writing the impossible object category containing numerous um, group chats and also several dedicated voice channels. So that's just a sort of glimpse of where we will be going a little bit later. Feedback. I'm not even going to try to go into sufficient detail about this um, right now, but if you have read the course material so far, you'll see that we we go into yeah, a fair bit of detail about specifically about ways of giving feedback, which I guess is one of the, the central pillars of this course. Um, it's, I think, a the, the specific kind of five step process that we uh, talk about in the, in the in the syllabus is is pretty important to us and we'll be sure to address that in as much detail as necessary when we're in discord a bit later but yeah just wanted to mention it as an element pretty much in and of itself prompts um I mean, what was there to say about prompts one of the nice things about writers groups in my experience has been that even if you're working on a project which you might have in mind before the writers group, as some of you probably do, or uh, as in before the course begins, or 
something that you come up with an idea for in the you know in the course of the various sessions you might be working on that for quite a long period of time but one of the nice things about writers groups is that they push you into doing little exercises that you may not normally make yourself do um essentially kind of prompts for you know brief writing that doesn't have to be connected to any particular project and we will be um setting you or we'll be aiming to set you prompts for most sessions our guests will be as well Again, we'll go into more detail about that um, later on, and also there's detail on it in the um, in the document. I think now is where I hand back. No, it's not quite where I hand back to Shauna. Um, um, talking briefly about the reading group, um, the idea behind this course is that it's going to be very practically focused, or as much as possible, on matters of writing, the real nitty gritty of actually writing texts. But at the same time. We're aware that we've set quite a lot of texts on the reading list that might prompt quite rich theoretical reflections. Now, we don't want to be constantly just sort of shutting these down um, in the in the sessions themselves. And of course, the only reason we would be doing that is for lack of time. Um, what we thought would be better is for there to be a separate reading group running in parallel to the course, where there is a lot more time to select and pour over texts and essentially for there to be no particular limit on the time you know taken to discuss them and also the way in which they're discussed okay so back to you Shauna course work yes uh we wanted to just sort of uh outline a few things briefly here so participants will be invited to submit three pieces of work um two shorter up to 2,000 words, and one longer, up to 4,000 words. All the details are in new information, so you'll have this already, but the, the, the deadlines for those are August the 10th, October the 19th for the two shorter pieces, and then for the longer piece, December the 21st. One thing we just wanted to make clear is that you have complete freedom with these submissions over you know what you write. Um, so the prompts are, are really, uh, there's no requirement for you to, to use any of the work that you've done in the prompts. Um, you can use uh, writing that you've done before, elsewhere, you know, or it can be something that's 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 been generated throughout the your time on the course. It's it's entirely up to you. Uh, two important uh, bits of information. Uh, please no word documents, no pages, nothing like that, just PDF. Um, please. <laughs> and um, also you must submit it to uh, Ross and me and our email addresses are there, so you'll have that. So send it to both of us, PDFs only. And those emails are in the in the, the syllabus document as well, if you, uh, if you need them. Okay, so what, how are we doing for time? Okay, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, right, let me unshare this. And start that. Bear with me one moment, just waiting for my talk to reload. All right. So I was thinking the other day about the various writers group type situations I've experienced, mostly as a participant, and felt, to state the obvious, that they've all sought to address the same question. How do you write? It was the level at which they addressed it that varied. I've been in groups devoted to quite mechanical matters of genre, especially when I used to work in film, and differently, of course, when I was doing academic research. There, the question, how do you write, was addressed in quite a precise, box-ticking kind of way, in that the groups involved learning quite closed schemas and formulae that would either be given to you or that you could work out, that you could work with others to gradually uncover in order to master a form quite comforting and satisfying in a way. What these courses tended to have less to say about, however, was a deeper level at which the question, how do you write, can be asked. How do you write if you feel uncertain about what you're writing or even inhibited? If the path to writing what you want to write is not going to be navigated merely 
by perfecting something at the level of technical facility. In fact, I sometimes found the more surface level courses could be somewhat inhibiting themselves in relation to that deeper level, especially if I felt I was trying to do something a little or a lot off the beaten track. It wasn't that they didn't address it at all, but there was a tendency to wave you away in the direction of books that could supposedly solve the problem for you, like Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. By the way, you'll notice that most of my references are to writing fiction or imaginative work. Uh, and this is partly because it's what I know better and partly because it's just a lot easier to find writers reflecting on writing in those contexts. Um, I've actually find it quite hard. I found it quite hard to turn up much material by writers of theory um, and so on in that area, at least in terms of the day-to-day -day practice of writing. The Artist's Way is a great book that has many very useful exercises, including journaling, writing morning pages, things that you may already be familiar with, and we would certainly recommend it. But turning back to the writers' groups I've known, I can see now that what I was really looking for were contexts in which the obstacles, essentially obstacles thrown up by the unconscious, could be more directly spoken about and addressed. Because it's definitely the unconscious, in my opinion, that can both get in the way and show the way forward when, was it, when one is at a standstill writing, no matter what the genre. There was one writer's group that was genre agnostic and organized around quick prompts where you weren't meant to think too hard and were supposed to just write stuff that didn't have to be good. A kind of writing closer to automatic writing, really. This opened the door somewhat to understanding how one could make more of a place for the unconscious in allowing inspiration or impulse to marry up with technique. And the centrality of those exercises meant that we could also actually talk a bit more openly about where we felt blocked or inhibited, <clears throat> excuse me, and have a rudimentary vocabulary for it rather than it being sort of taboo. The very best group writing exercises I've had have not actually been group ones per se, but the one on ones that can arise from a group situation or just otherwise in life. The most productive of these reminded me a little of my experiences of psychoanalysis not in the sense of having a reader who is somehow responsible for a therapeutic process, because that is certainly something for the psychoanalyst's couch, and it's vital to know where the line is drawn, but in some of the following ways. In the sense of finding a shorthand to discuss highly idiosyncratic things. In the sense of finding a trusted close reader of one's text. In the sense of the degree of care and attention that could be given to examining individual words and phrases, especially as they resonated through a longer text, in the sense of having the opportunity, importantly, to also discuss what is not there, and in the sense of having the ability to talk quite intimately about inspiration and plans for the text and floating ideas and so on. I felt that that kind of situation was where I engaged most closely with the question, how do you write? at any level of depth that I wanted to, and understood the dimensions that it took for me personally, especially the dimensions and placements of the obstacles on my way and the tools specific to me in overcoming them. I'm mentioning all this because I wanted to say a little about what level we're pitching this course at and felt why not address it right at the start. We're pitching this course somewhere in the middle of the writing situations I've just described is the answer. We want to keep things oriented towards finding and discussing practical ways of producing work in whichever genre you want to work in. But we also want to make some sort of place for the deeper levels that I've said the other courses I experienced or have experienced didn't really touch on or not enough. Maybe the best we can do is just to introduce a vocabulary for it. And a good starting point for that, I think, is what Samuel Delaney writes in the text that we set for this week about this notion of begeisterung. I remember reading this for the first time and feeling a sense of recognition and indeed relief, simply that someone had named an aspect of the writing process that I did not hitherto have a vocabulary for. I had experienced feeling in the groove with writing and also hating my writing and wanting to give up. 
I'd experienced the surge of energy that can come from feeling I was on a worthwhile path. And also the drain of energy that came from feeling I was on a worthless path. I'd experienced embarking on some projects where I had the drive and instinct to research and structure a somewhat abstract process in the service of a more concrete and imaginative goal. And others, and others where I just mysteriously didn't all set between the poles of feeling able and feeling inhibited. It helped me to know that these could all be brought under the umbrella of Big Eisterum, at least as Delaney defines it. And it's his use of the term we're going to be considering, because I couldn't really find much English language scholarship on the way Schiller and co understood the concept. There is Shaftesbury's letter concerning enthusiasm, which is probably covering similar territory, but ultimately I'd rather stick with Delaney. Here, to recap, is the passage where Delaney discusses Begeisterung most directly. The early German romantics believed something they called Begeisterung was the most important element among the processes that constituted the creative personality. I think they were right. Begeisterung is usually translated as inspiration. Geist is the German word for spirit, and Begeisterung means literally be spiritedness, which is certainly close to inspiration. As the word is traditionally used in ordinary German, though, it is even closer to enthusiasm, spirited, in the sense of a spirited horse or a spirited prize fighter. For the Romantics, Begeisterung was not just the initial idea or the talent one had to realize it. Begeisterung was both intellectual and bodily. A form of spirit was also a mode of will. For the Romantics, this enthusiasm slash begeisterung carried the artist through the work's creation. If there were things you didn't know that you needed in order to write your story, your novel, your play, with enough begeisterung, you could always go out and learn them. If your imagination wasn't throwing out the brilliant scenes and moments, to make the material dramatic. With Begeisterung, you could arrive at such effective material through dogged intelligence, though it might take longer and require more energy. If you lacked the verbal talent that produced vivid descriptive writing, well, there were hard analytic styles that were also impressive, which you could craft through intellectual effort, though you would have to attack the work sentence by sentence. But however you employed it, Begeisterung is what carried you through the job. Begeisterung could make up for failures on other creative fronts. Begeisterung is what artists share over their otherwise endless differences. Enthusiasm for a task clearly perceived. I think that's such a good formula. Enthusiasm for a task clearly perceived. And why is this important to us? Well, for a start, I know how many projects I've given up on or not been able to give my all to and conversely other ones that I've been able to see through to completion because of a dimension that felt at once affective and quite cognitive or rational, tipped a bit, toward, a bit more towards the former than the latter, and which I feel requires some sort of terminology to make practically addressable. And to me, that is Big Eisterum, as Delaney describes it. And this is especially important for the sorts of writing we are considering. One of the reasons why we could not convene a writer's group of the first mechanical sort I described, even if we wanted, the type where it's all about learning the rules and applying them, is that we're treating genres here where there are no fixed rules, where a certain spirit or spiritedness is required to find your own rules, your own quite specific ways to pursue your own idiosyncratic aims, and to be able to do so while maintaining faith in what you're trying to achieve. And mentioning this is also important as part of an attempt to invoke a certain spirit in this group. I want us to try to foster each other's begeisterung, practical enthusiasm for writing that can help you produce or make progress with things you thought impossible. Write the impossible object. We'll address what I mean here in more detail as we go on, but briefly, I'm thinking about things like enthusiasm and respect for the different types of project everyone is working on, even if they're beyond our own knowledge areas and expertise. 
I also mean ways of giving feedback so that they prioritize bolstering and amplifying the big Easter room that another person has for their project. I mean always thinking, what character does this person's spiritedness for their writing take, and how can I help amplify it, or at the very least avoid disturbing it? Like I said, there's much more depth to go into on those points, but I hope you see what spin the introduction of that notion and making it central to the way this group thinks of itself as a group gives to the question, how do you write? And now I want to talk about Samuel Beckett. Beckett is an interesting figure for us to consider on this course and in a sense to inaugurate it with because many of the writers we put on the reading list have had strong reactions to him, either of fidelity or of rejection or fidelity in rejection or vice versa. One could almost say that his example, his method and so on played a role for those writers in their big Easter room for their own work, their own enthusiasm for a task clearly perceived. Beckett's also interesting because he wrote in all three, arguably, arguably all three of the very different genres we're examining here, genres that are not necessarily all that straightforwardly immensurable with each other. Beckett wrote fiction and drama, of course, genres generally written under the sign of narrative, but he also wrote critical commentaries and works of theory at other times in his life. He steadily gained prestige over the course of the 20th century as a writer who used or deployed ideas from the history of philosophy in his fiction more legibly and more ostentatiously than some of his contemporaries, such that he is one of the forebears of one genealogy of theory fiction. What I want to zone in on, if I can, is how Beckett wrote, not in terms of style, but in terms of the Geisterum. What resources did Beckett draw on in order to be able to write? Whereby did the process of writing become enchanted for him, if we can say that? And also whereby did it gain productive disenchantment? We're fortunate in that there are plenty of anecdotes from his life that shine a light on this, or at least give us suggestive clues. In the first decade or so of Beckett's writing career, he was outwardly getting on quite well, following his own version of a path broken by Joyce. But more inwardly, he was beset with difficulties, disappointments, constraints of various kinds. The influence of Joyce was as inhibiting as it was empowering. One of Beckett's earliest unfinished plays, Human Wishes, portrays the ailing Dr. Johnson and is a kind of symbolic killing off or undermining of the master of the white male genius figure that Beckett himself also gradually became enshrined as after his Nobel Prize win. Then there were the funda fundamental, then there were the mundane difficulties in publishing Murphy and the not so mundane difficulties of writing what while he was on the run from the Nazis, alongside a strong sense of personal failure as well as deep depression after the war. All this led up to a reckoning and indeed an epiphany with a precise date in Beckett's telling of it sometime in 1945 to six, in which he claims to realize, and this is, uh, I'm reading out a quote from, from Beckett here, to realize that Joyce had gone as far as one could in the direction of knowing more, being in control of one's material. He was always adding to it. You only have to look at his proofs to see that. I realized that my own way was in impoverishment, in lack of knowledge, and in taking away, in subtracting rather than adding. This quite famous thought clearly became a kind of organon that guided him through what he wrote in quite a different register in the late 1940s and after. In Delaney's terms, you can see how this must have both been a source of inspiration at the level of ideas, a guide and a filter in terms of which these were to be considered worth pursuing or not, and a source of encouragement at more of a passional level something that he could return to in order to determine if he was on the right track or not. And from there, to set out to know, or indeed to not know, the things he needed in order to write any given piece of work. You must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on, as he wrote at the end of The Unnameable. 
Incidentally, it's interesting how he brackets the entire early trilogy of his novels with essentially quite personal mottos. Perhaps another time we'll discuss the importance of the opening of Malloy. I am in my mother's room. It is I who live there now. I actually had a whole 10 minute section on that, which I decided was probably a little bit too much uh, for the first session. Um, so um, you can thank your lucky stars that you've been spared that. There's another bit of his table talk that I also want to think about too, which betrays a sense of the deeper level at which Beckett worked out how to write or what writing was for him. And this is contained within a conversation reported by Patrick Bowles, Beckett's translator. They've just been having quite an interesting conversation about Carl Jung and a few other things somewhat psychoanalytic in nature. Patrick Bowles wonders how anyone does anything. He gives an example, and this is a long Patrick Bowles quote that's coming now. Someone thinks, I will get out of bed. They don't. I will get out of bed. And then they do, as if by magic. By magic being what we don't understand. I told Beckett, one says to someone in a catatonic, in a catatonic stupor, apparently, make an effort of will. Ridiculous. Make an effort of will. Still nothing. One talks, exhorts, even shakes them. There is no response. When they begin talking lucidly, as if their earlier rigidity had never happened, one can never know what made them break the circle within which they circled. One moment they were in it, then not. And then Beckett says this in direct, if enigmatic, response. It is as if there were a little animal inside one's head for which one tried to find a voice, for which one tries to give a voice. That is the real thing. The rest is a game. I'm going to read that out again just because it's so brief and compressed. It is as if there were a little animal inside one's head for which one tried to find a voice to which one tries to give a voice. That is the real thing. The rest is a game. What is he talking about? It seems to me that while he's not talking about writing specifically, he's not not talking about writing either. On one level, this phrase, little animal, seems to me an attempt to find a figure to fit the themes Bowles has been circling around, which touch on the traffic between the pre-conscious and the unconscious, some of the questions that also preoccupied their contemporary, Natalie Sorot. It can't have been by chance that even though Beckett appears to be talking about the id, he reaches for the phrase little animal, not little beast or homunculus or thing or being, but animal, like anima, soul, therefore retaining the link to mind. But at the same time, he chooses more overtly to make it non-human, mute, uncomprehending, perhaps, id-like, but not quite or not just the id. It lacks a voice, a voice of its own. Perhaps it doesn't need or want one, but its state of depredation seems to invite from the other the gift of a voice, this clearly not being for Beckett, a case of whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. A gift which it might not be able to accept or know what to do with. It's quite an image. The thinking subject as voice haver, haver of many voices like Joyce, and the little animal as voice lacquer. Probably a voice means something else to it, if it means anything at all. Maybe something that tells it what to do, when to eat, mere sound rather than information. And the first, trying to give this gift to the latter with tragicomic results. That is the real thing. The rest is a game. When I read those sentences, and they're, for Beckett, slightly gauche essentialist references to real things, and a bit later on in the same conversation, the idea of rendering the world truly, my instinct is to frisk them for a Beckettian joke, maybe one meant to work across several languages, especially given that Beckett is speaking to his own translator, the one who, hilariously enough, he deemed so inadequate to the task that he just did all the translation himself. But when I look for the joke, I'm not sure there is one. 
I feel like he means what he says quite sincerely in that moment. I think he's dispensing with his capacity for clever humour. Somehow the funniest thing and the most touching one is that he seems here to be totally straight up, speaking intimately to a friend without fear of judgment, revealing something quite fundamental about what gets him up in the morning and means what he does, sorry, it means that he does anything at all, including sitting at the writing desk, trying to find a voice, trying to give a voice to the little animal in his head. So there's a second useful concept to add to our vocabulary regarding the question, how do you write? The Geisterung supplies an almost cybernetic blueprint linking affect, attitude, research, gusto, etc., etc. But there is a gap at its center where how shades into why. Why do you write? Why do you spend all this time doing the thing that no one asked you to do? As I remember Gabriel Yosevavici saying somewhere in an interview. Beckett's answer, there is a little animal inside you that lacks a voice and you supply that voice. Mitatis mutandis, that seems a sufficient pretext to do any sort of writing. I'm going to hand over to Shauna in a moment, but before I do, there's one more quote I wanted to read out because it's just so great. And I think the applicability both to writing and to what I've just been talking about, and indeed what Shauna is going to be talking about will be quite clear without further explanation. It's from an essay by William Gass called Exile, and it's in his book, Finding a Form, which is on our, on our reading list. A friend has told me how it felt to flee East Germany as a child of 10 and to leave behind the real companions of her heart. She had a number of dolls, which she cared for in a most motherly way. And she reported to them everything that happened to her and shared with them what she read and explained to them how she felt and what she thought. Above all, she invented stories for each one, since each was an individual and had personal preferences. It was natural that the stories would begin to intertwine, creating a single enriched narrative, one part of which she would then relate to the doll most deserving of it, while another part she would tell to the doll desiring that. So she had a special listener for each part of her life. A listener who listened with the same sort of attentive ear and sympathized and supported and forgave, perhaps more perfectly than her own heart could. Whatever needed forgiveness, hugs, reassurance, tears. Okay, so what what do theory fiction and theory fiction have in common? In the sense that they're all interested in remaking the world via a retelling of the world, what they have in common is their mimetic function. Mimesis is, of course, a central, if contested, term in Western philosophy. But here I'm using it more or less in the Aristotelian sense. The mimetic function of these types of literature for following our Aristotle, for whom mimesis is imitation in the sense of this creative retelling such that something hidden is, re is revealed. We can actually go so far as to say that mimesis is equivalent to the mythos insofar as worlds are created and transformed. So mimesis has very little to do with simply holding up a mirror to the world. It's an interweaving of theory, it's, it's in an interweaving of theory and fiction that we are invited to experience the world otherwise. And we may find that new worlds are possible. Ricoeur uses a metaphor of a musical score to explain a process that he calls the synthesis of the heterogeneous. Uh, and we can apply that to theory fiction. And um, musical score is made up of a variety of different elements. Um, you, you have notes, rhythms, tempos, and these elements are often heterogeneous, but it's through their interplay that music is created. So we can say the same thing for theory fiction. 
Um, the different elements are often heterogeneous, but it's through their interplay that new expressive possibilities are opened up. In order to do this, of course, we're constantly bashing up against the limits of the sayable. Um, and before I go on to talk more about this, I just want to pause here to talk a little bit about um, the somewhat uncomfortable question of what theory fiction actually is. As a hybrid form, it resists both canonization and the constraints of genre, which are both irrelevant. Um, it can't be defined by a set of fixed characteristics. And I guess I can't really answer that question in a particularly satisfying way. Um, what I can say, I suppose, is um, that the classification of theory fiction is primarily shaped by the framing it receives, um, the perceptions it evokes, and the lenses through which it's approached. While we can recognize that it may involve the exploration and development of a set of thoughts without placing significant emphasis perhaps on traditional elements such as plot or character development, um, I think we can do a little bit better than that. The closest we can go to providing any kind of def defining criteria uh, is to say that theory fiction is a sort of unveiling of mimesis and aesthetics as the long lost counterparts to the conceptual structures of critical theory. So this is not philosophical fiction um, and it's not philosophy that uses stories. It's something else again. It's literature where mimesis and theory are engaged in a coordinated dynamic relationship and attempt to dance forth coherence from inherent disorder. And this is exciting. <laughs> well, it should be. <laughs> because for any kind of dance or any kind of courtship, um, there's got to be a spark of excitement. And this is clearly part of the begeisterung that Ross has talked about. So we hope to establish a bond between reader and the work. Um, this, of course, includes ourselves as our first readers of our own work. The thrill of reading can arise unexpectedly from unconventional sources, and there's no predefined, universally applicable toolkit for generating excitement um, within literature. So over the next eight months, we will explore, both as readers and as writers. As writers, we will um, experiment with innovative approaches and um, discover new ways to generate surprise. Um, and as readers, we'll practice receiving surprise um, rather than seeking mere analysis, the emphasis will be on receiving surprise. We'll be twisting the threads of a text to really feel the texture of how an idea is articulated as an invitation to see it differently, creating a whole new tapestry of ideas. So I mentioned that theory fiction is a lot to do with the perception it evokes. Blake Butler said of Roberto Bolaño, uh, that he seemed to come from an understanding that people are portholes, that a creation can represent a singular space that otherwise would go unknown, that what survives of someone is often beyond them, beyond control, though also a thing that can be aimed at and desired, built. A fundamental assumption of writing the impossible object that we know from Beckett and others is that all writing fails. But what does this mean? As a mediating force, it can only ever offer a perspective on a thing rather than the thing itself. A perspective situated in the dynamic interplay of gaps and absences, the elusive beyond always evading linguistic capture. On the example of Malamé's poems, Blanchot shows us that language does not merely talk in the absence of things as if words try to represent absent objects. Instead, he argues, the word itself manages to eliminate the object and talk in its absence. So just as hermeneutics involves inter interpreting and making sense of the silences within a text, 
Theory fiction navigates the impossible uncharted landscapes of human ex ex existence and experience. Uncharted means limitless, which means void. And once there's a word, the object is lost in the void. So there's always this gap, this void between mimesis and the lived experience that it's attempts to articulate. This gap, this imposition of the void is completely unavoidable because all writing is an exposure to an outside, um, what might have been called the divine, um, the sublime, the infinite, which Blanchet refers to as the other of all worlds. So we inevitably fall short of an absolute and complete representation because writing is situated within a system of signs and symbols that mediate our understanding of the world. Crucially, writing operates within the realm of absence and difference, constantly pointing beyond itself to that which it cannot fully grasp or express. So if writing fails, then what are we all doing here? Well, um, it's this site of failure, the void, is where things get interesting. Indeed, the failure of language to represent is not a deficiency to be overcome, um, but it's rather an essential aspect of writing itself. Um, it's through this failure that writing opens up a space of possibility. As Blanchot argues, the closer literature gets to this fundamental emptiness, the more it is literature. The closer literature gets to the void, the closer it gets to its mystery. Blanchot argues that storytelling in the tradition of the, the in, in the French tradition of the Racy um, has a unique power to um, shape our understanding of the world and our place within it. Um, in the book to come, he explains the difference between the novel and the Racy um, by using an allegory of the law of the, the sirens and the Odyssey. He compares the novel to Odysseus, uh, sorry, um, Ulysses um, and his careful navigations to kind of circumvent the dangerous temptations on the rocks. And this novelistic manoeuvring is contrasted with the way the Racy answers the law of the sirens. So where the novel turns away, the Racy seems to pause and surrender. Derrida writes about finding truth on the boundaries and in the margins. Um, he says the margin is not simply the outside, the excluded. It's also the place of the supplement, the excess, the surplus. So the margin is the supplement along with the trace, um, which is the mark that's left behind even when um, it's no longer present. These are the creative and generative engines of craft. Um, the trace, um, one of these three engines, may lead us to the belief that the world interacts with us as much as we interact with the world. Um, the, the coincidence is in fact co um, communication. The coincidences and chance encounters within the narrative uh, can be seen as moments of communication between the narrator, the reader and the world itself. Derrida says that the trace is always already present in every act of communication. So when we write, we're not simply creating new wor words, we're drawing on traces of the past, we're using words that have been used before us, we're adding our own meaning to them. Um, the trace is al also always already present in every act of interpretation we make. So when we read a text, we're not simply decoding a message, we're also interacting with the trace of the author's voice. We're hearing the author's voice in our own voice and we're adding our own mystery to the text. For Blanchot, the mystery, though it may be unrepresentable, exists only by means of its rapport with language. So the obligation of literature is to reveal this paradox rather than to conceal it. Um, and on this course, we are going to be constantly challenging the assumption that writing's purpose is to transparently convey meaning. Um, 
our writing should be more than a, a mere conduit for ideas. And what I mean by this is the idea that the void is sort of beckoning us to embark on a relationship um, with it. So to sort of wholeheartedly engage with the, um, engage in the collaborative act of meaning making. Um, participation in uh, an intricate dance of co-creating meaning and it's an incredibly sort of exciting idea to me um, that the failure of our writing is actually a gateway, it's a portal. I have the sense that the very best readers and writers go with the sense of awe. Um, I like to think that they've cultivated what the 18th century um, theologian Friedrich um, Schleiermacher called a sense and taste for the infinite. So if we are committed to a writing practice, it seems that um, we must have some sort of relationship with the void as an enigmatic sort of space of potential where meaning emerges from the interplay between the liminal and the concrete. It prompts us to navigate the gaps and the uncertainties, actively participating in the co-creation of, of significance. And both Derrida and Blanchot emphasize, emphasize the importance of embracing liminal spaces and the unpredictable aspects of language and narrative. So, as Ross has alluded to, writing is this ongoing conversation, this ever-evolving dialogue between writer, text and reader. What if our prayers to the void were answered? This is, this is my question that, uh, that stays with me all the time. After all, it's a two-way communion. Writing simultaneously reveals and conceals creates and erases. It's exciting as a reader to look through the porthole and witness this dance. And in the process, reader and writers may do their own sort of push-pull dance between presence and absence, the visible and the invisible, and the tension between revealing and withholding. There's an aspect to all of this that I want to end on, and I'm going to do that by way of talking a little bit about Muriel Spark. The thing I want to stress is that both Begeisterung and Beckett's Little Animal and the conversation with or the prayer to the void um, all place the writer in relation to others, whether those others are out there in the world or internal and inside one's own head. Um, writing takes place in the scene of the two, in Badiou's terms. I don't know if anyone has read the Muriel Spark uh, novel that we put under the optional reading this week, um, but it contains a really nice piece of writing advice. I'm gonna read that now. She says, you're writing a letter to a friend was the sort of thing I used to say. And this is a dear and close friend, real or better, invented in your mind like a fixation. Write privately, not publicly, without fear or timidity, write to the end of the letter as if it was never going to be published so that your true friend will read it over and over and then want more enchanting letters from you. Now, you're not writing about the relationship between your friend and yourself. You take that for granted. You're only confiding an experience that you think only they will enjoy reading. What you have to say will come up more spontaneously and honestly than if you're thinking of numerous readers. Before starting the letter, rehearse in your mind what you're going to tell. Something interesting, your story. But don't rehearse too much. The story will develop as you go along, especially if you write to a special friend, uh, to make them smile or laugh or cry. Anything you like, so long as you know it will interest. Remember not to think of the reading public. It will put you off. What does it mean to write for friends? In my opinion, it can mean some of the following things. It can mean intimacy, uh, being able in whatever way you think right to articulate your deeper convictions without fear of judgment. It can mean to state the obvious, ranging through the thematic terrain created by your friendship, um, the common interests, tastes, beliefs that brought you together, the things that forge the bond um, that you can look to a large extent presume and take for granted um, that has certain givens that uh, has always held 
a space in which you can say things about yourself, in which there's a capacity for you to feel seen. Um, incidentally, this is an explanation for Chekhov's famous advice to junk the first three pages of anything you write, um, because to keep them would be tantamount to telling your friend a load of stuff that they already know about you. It can also mean a certain sort of shorthand uh, for that terrain, uh, the sort of um, shorthand that enables friends to get straight to the heart of conversational topics that uh, they may have invented their own vocabulary for, that no one else discusses in quite that way, um, which is one way of thinking where newly coined terms in theory or fiction might stem from. It can mean a certain sh shared humour um, that you can take for granted, or, or even just at the level of mood, rhythm, tone, vibe rather than actual jokes. Um, it can mean using a certain medium. So if we're being very literal about it, some of us probably write long emails to our friends and express ourselves very differently than if we were sort of handwriting a letter. Um, more of us probably use social media to chat um, privately or semi-publicly with, with people. Um, and a good micro um, writing exercise is what's the WhatsApp version of what you want to say or what's the Twitter version and so on. So to conclude, um, let's consider why the friend that Spark describes um, wants to read what you write over and over. Maybe it's because what you wrote them is good in and of itself, regardless of who wrote it. But I think more importantly, it's probably because it's from you and you shaped it specifically for them and no one else. Um, and as a result of all the other things I've mentioned, you, your writing moves in a certain way, has a certain signature um, that your friend is interested in, and not just to experience, but then to re-experience. Um, they're interested in how a, a certain thought is thought by you. So how a thought is thought by you, not by someone else that they have no history with. There's also a third party in that relationship, something that comes together within the relationship between you and your friend, between reader and writer. And that something, that thing is, is compelling and exciting and unique. Here I'm thinking about the great bit in the Lynn Tillman interview that we set this week, um, where she talks about the non-importance of whether a piece of writing is quote unquote, experimental or uh, traditional. Um, she says, one of the keys to innovation, the central one as far as I'm concerned, is the way a thought is thought. The way a thought is thought. We really, really like that. Um, rather than some abstract notion of uh, how experimental a chosen form is. Um, Lynn is um, mostly referring to fiction in that paragraph, but I think it applies um, equally to theory in that one of the simple definitions of theory is that it's um, a form that aims to think a thought differently with the intended result of surprise. Um, indeed, theory is a surprise machine as it's described in um, Paul DiMaggio's piece, um, comments on what theory is not. Um, a set of character, um, so he says, a set of categories and domain assumptions aimed at clearing away conventional notions to make room for artful and exciting insights. And I'll hand back to Ross. Amazing, thank you. Um, I noticed we're a bit, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule actually. Um, I think we, we thought we would be uh, getting to this point around sort of quarter past the hour. Um, so I am wondering whether we might do the introductions before the break, potentially. Um, yeah, I think that might be a good good idea. Um, so yeah, Alan, would you be able to lead uh, the course participants in just introducing themselves, um, taking about maybe max 30 seconds over it? Um, yeah. You probably have, yeah, experience in kind of like, yeah, how this is normally done in the new center courses. Yeah, just a short introduction, 30 seconds, why you're interested in the course, what you're doing, uh, all of this. No? So I'll just, um, I mean, if anyone wants to volunteer, otherwise I'll just kind of like read from. Let me just go through the class lists uh, as in the, the spreadsheet. So just okay. kind of in whatever order. Uh, that comes up. Yeah, sure. So then, um, Taufi. 
And then I don't know if you've seen, there's a message uh, from Patrick. He um, needs to be made a panelist. Um, okay, I'll, I'll check that out and we can go uh, with the introduction. I'll, I'll check Patrick's, uh, yeah. But we can start with Tao Fei. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is Tao. Um, I'm terrible at introductions even after three years of pandemic Zooms, um, so I'll keep it super short. Um, I'm a cultural worker based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And yeah, it's been a pretty mute time um, for me over the past few years in terms of my writing. Um, so hoping that this, this gentle course um, manages to spark something and I hope to generate, <laughs> see if something comes of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I am, I used to write a lot of criticism um, around and alongside performance and practices of embodiment. Um, but right now I'm very interested in experiments in communal living. So might be something um, that comes up along those things. Excited to work with you all. Thanks. Thank you. Now, uh, Rodney Morin. Hi everyone, I'm Rodney. Uh, I'm based in Philly. Uh, I'm a dancer and artist. My full-time job is, uh, I work as a sommelier. Uh, so I study wine, research wine, drink it. Um, uh, interested in meeting all of you and uh, really am interested in this course just because it happened upon me. I saw a link for it and am working on some projects sort of adjacent to this work and think it'll be nice to be in this space. And I think it'll be really invigorating. Uh, Gaslam, Mosebek. Uh, Gaslam, are you there? Mm, can't unmute. Mm. Mm. Okay, yeah, no problem. Um, maybe you can write uh, yeah, like an introduction in the chat if you like. Uh, Linda Franke. Um, hello, uh, I'm Linda and I am um, in LA, but I'm German. Um, and I'm a visual artist, but I also perform in my work and make films and sound. And uh, yeah, I'm really interested in writing more myself because I'm usually in my work um, edit text that already exists. Um, and I'm kind of, it really kind of started to, like I started to think about it a lot, why I'm doing this actually, or what's the, the kind of the hang up of writing myself. Um, even though I'm actually creating uh, through interviews, I create these texts usually myself that I'm rewriting, but still it's a totally different process than writing on your desk kind of by yourself. And I have been actually writing quite a bit this year. So I'm kind of uh, got like ready for it. <laughs> more like a, what, what Ross talked about, more like in a journal type of way to have a practice where I write every day to kind of get over the fact that it needs to be interesting or whatever, to just see what's actually there. And also practice actually handwriting because I was a little afraid to lose that suddenly. Um, yeah, excited for this course. Give it over to the next person. Uh, next one is uh, Gregors. I hope I pronounced it right. It's pretty all right. Hi, I'm Gregors and uh, I'm a multimedia artist. I'm mostly working with video performance. And so I really want to move for a longer video. This is my name here. 
I'm a PhD student too, working around the region in visual arts. Uh, I'm living in Kast right now, but I'm from Poland. And yeah, I think it's enough <laughs> right now. And it's really nice to meet you all. I'm glad to be here. Uh, next, I have um, Kasaya. Kas. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kasaya. I also go by Kas. It, it's uh, it's both for comfort and also for reasons of a genderless name. Kas, they, them. I. I'm a huge fan of the new center. I actually recognize a couple of people here that I've taken other classes with. And uh, I am uh, Iranian born, Toronto based uh, poet, writer, translator. And uh, that's pretty much it. Hello from uh, sunny, sunny Montreal today. I'm in Montreal, but uh, uh, that's it for now. Great, thank you. Now, uh, Matthew Mulligan. Hey, yeah, I'm Matt, um, based in LA, working film. Uh, taken a number of courses at the New Center before, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, I've been feeling, as maybe Tao said as well, a bit stagnant and looking forward to hoping to, I don't know, be inspired a bit. Rory, can again? Hey, uh, I'm Rory. I've been I've been in university the past few years studying theater and right now philosophy. And my number one feedback from profs is that they'll say like, you know, you can't write this like you're going way off basis. Like you need to stick to like, you know, whatever the one small article is. And I've yeah, I've just been super frustrated with that. Um, and yeah, doing really bad in university because I want to get creative in all of my texts and they're like, no, please, we don't want that here. So I'm happy to bring it here and I'm excited that I get to explore that. Rebecca. Hello, I'm Rebecca. I'm from Sweden, but right now based in New York for a few months. I'm uh, an artist working with painting uh, mainly. I, I've been interested in this course because I found, find painting and writing and language to be very connected. And um, yeah, I'm just writing a lot myself and want to see what this kind of course could do for, for my practice generally. And I'm looking forward to it a lot. Thank you. Now I have um, Elisabetta. Hey, hey, um, I'm Elisabetta. I'm based in Amsterdam. Um, I'm from Moscow. Uh, I'm an artist and researcher and um, here today because I'm working on a project for quite some time and it uh, requires some um, substantial writing in the end and uh, I've been sort of preparing myself to start and I thought it would be a good way to push and uh, give me some deadlines <laughs> so yeah and I also I've uh, barely ever written anything before so I felt like it would be cool to learn if it's possible even I hope so yeah that's cool. Now, uh, Sarah Clark. Mm, I think Sarah is not here. Eileen. Mm, Hi, everyone. My name is Eileen. I'm joining you from Vancouver. And I'm I'm an unusual uh, artist. I'm not a professional writer. I have my own struggles and fear with writing and written way of communication. And the 
way that the things are going on in my studio and uh, my practice is that um, consciously, unconsciously, I'm exploring my performative uh, aspect of reading and writing. And I thought I would be a nice opportunity uh, taking this class and facing my fears of writing and glad to be here. Uh, and yeah. now back to Sarah because I think uh, they were in ATV. Sorry, sorry. I'm just I'm hi. I'm Sarah. Um, I'm just on tour. I'm I'm a musician and theater artist, and we were driving like for ten hours today. So I apologize for the chaos of coming to you live from a motorized vehicle. Um, I'm just uh, yeah. I'm I've never taken a course in the New Center before. I do a lot of uh, theatrical writing and. Uh, love philosophy and theory and I've been trying to integrate those for a while and so I am um, yeah I'm just curious to see what this brings and uh yes that's good <laughs> thanks now I have um next person uh baby hi uh I'm Biddy I'm from New Zealand and I'm an art history student and I took this course because, uh, yeah, I want to kind of get into theory fiction specifically. Um, and I thought that this would like assist me in, um, you know, writing criticism. Um, I'm writing a text to a friend's show in August. So I thought that this would be a good way to like generate ideas for that. Um, there are a few texts that I got excited about in the uh, syllabus. Uh, I recognize some. Um, I liked Marina Spallings by the Bernadette Corporation people and some of the writing on contemporary art daily. So yeah, hoping to like dive more into that into that list. Mm, Anna. Hey, I'm Anna. I'm coming from a context that is oriented towards um community organizing with a post-capitalist commitment. And um, I'm really interested in the idea of developing various forms of, I guess, more imaginative theoretical um, types of um, bodies of writing, bodies of integrating different sorts of communities, specifically psychoanalysis and um, various forms of um, attempts to work cybernetic ideas into things like management theory. Um, and part of why I'm here is sort of to work on developing an orientation towards writing that could be more accountable to um, forms of communities that are dealing with different sorts of trauma, as well as um, an attempt to think of how scientific knowledge and theoretical formation could be oriented towards therapeutic problems and economic issues as well. Um, and I have also, I also worked a little bit with uh, Tao Fei on, Tao mentioned doing stuff with respect to communal living. Um, and I'm really interested in the idea of um, using tokenomics or blockchain stuff to develop sort of um, capitalist modes of exchange that um, could also be worked into like various ways of sort of more imaginatively framing that kind of context um, from a sort of like utopian or post-utopian writing perspective. Mm, Noah? Hey, um, I've been doing like New Center stuff for I think six or seven months and I've just enjoyed all the classes I've done or seminars I've done so far and doing like a really long writing project for um, the transdisciplinary part and I thought that this would would be a helpful kind of thing to do um, to get me ready for that. Uh, I have um, James. Hey everyone, sorry if there's any background noise, but um, yeah, currently in New York, usually in Boulder, Colorado, um, 
Yeah, but just started as a certificate student here at the new center. Um, otherwise, a master's student in Colorado is in media studies. Um, interested in um, actually a lot of what I was just talking about um, through like, um, yeah, imaginative um, post capitalist futures through like Web3 and kind of maybe come from it from more of like a critique side, but still looking for and trying to imagine those alternative possibilities. And on the other side, I think like, most people who end up at the new center in some way, yeah, the same interest in theory, philosophy, theory fiction. And yeah, trying to go down that theory fiction middle road is, I guess, what I was kind of thinking about for this seminar um, and just how I would kind of think more about um, kind of these problems of imagination in the more technical or practical work, um, seeing those as working together um, in that respect. But yeah, looking forward to hearing you from here better. Juliana? Mm -hmm. Okay, one second. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Montreal based. I'm from Montreal. Um, I'm sort of primarily like a visual and 3d artist, but also, um, have been kind of writing and self publishing sort of, um, poetry books for the past few years. Um, uh, Sarah in the car is a, a great friend of mine. And, uh, when I was in Toronto recently, she told me that she was um, attending this course, and um, I uh, have managed not to uh, decide on a master's degree for next year. So I'm floating, uh, sort of, in a in a in a in a non-academic zone, and really kind of welcome the learning and community um, that could come from a course. And I also think that I want to um, sort of write and make work in a way that's like. Uh, like like resonant and kind of actually communicates um meaning in a way without sort of um like conceiving to a kind of like like vernacular or overly simple voice that i don't think is like uh natural to me or that i feel at home in um and so i'm looking for ways to sort of explore different writing practices from just kind of really abstract and kind of impenetrable ones um Thank you. Uh, I think I skipped uh, uh, Ravi. Uh, hi, my name is Raviv. I'm uh, based in New York City. That's also where I'm from. Uh, I'm a certificate student for the New Center. I'm doing critical philosophy um, with an interest in like uh, analytic philosophy and Marxism, I guess and some German idealism and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of different interests that I've been trying to juggle over the past few years, but um, writing fiction has been one of the things I've wanted to do probably for the longest time. And uh, there was a period a couple of years ago where I was producing a lot of fiction, just kind of like automatically, I would just kind of be doing it. And that sort of stopped a couple of years ago. And I was hoping that doing something like this and like, you know, getting someone to like put a gun to my head and like make me write fiction again would be healthy for me. So um, that's why I'm here. Uh, yeah. Riley. Hi, I'm Riley. Um, I'm based uh, in Roberts Creek, which is just north of Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I was also brought here by Tao <laughs> somehow. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist and a writer. Um, I've been working on a long form project for a number of years, and I, I'm like, I've like bottled necked myself into some mental strife, and uh, I would love. I guess to like either 
veer away from that or veer deeper into it. Um, and I just felt like a really interesting kind of like mix of uh, the theory fiction, which I'm really interested in. Um, it's my first class through the new center and yeah, I'm excited to be here and see what jiggles out. Thanks. Uh, Hi, I'm Ashita. I'm from India. Um, I'm a certificate student uh, at the New Center since last September. And um, I wanted to thank both uh, Ross and Shiona for uh, stressing on awe and surprise and, you know, the sense of wonder to um, invigorate writing and, you know, also sort of frustrate writing in that sense, um, because that's also the space that I have been in um, for almost, gosh, five years now. Um, and it, it became a personal uh, project, which is also what I proposed to sort of un, un, unravel through this course, um, where I found myself in a moment existentially, which then created more and more worlds. And I have sporadically and periodically and incessantly kept on writing about it in various forms, sometimes as films, sometimes as uh, project proposals, sometimes as budgetary items um, to and, and and using writing almost as a way to craft a new form of living. So um, I'm, I'm in this space where uh, it's become a dance between work and life and you know whatever form that work takes life has to follow and you know it it's 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 kind of that and therefore then the genre of theory fiction has become really important for me to um activate um i'm also very curious with the inability to define that genre because that means I cannot identify with certainty what is theory fiction within the Indian subcontinent. You know, there are things that feel like it, uh, but I have no way of knowing whether they are. Um, so I'm also hoping this helps bridge that kind of a gap and very excited to be here. Um, super, super pleased to see some of the people that I know, excited to see all the new people and hi Canada. Um, and now Leandra. Hi, my name is Leandra. I'm uh, here at New Center as a certificate student in disciplinary studies. Um, I write, I make music, and I, ca I also came a PhD in arts, um, but now I I'm more focused in in writing without the academic constraints, and I started um, a research on the aesthetics and mystics of fascism, um, and I'm Brazilian, and it was largely. The research was largely influenced uh, on what happened in at Bolsonaro's government here in Brazil, and and I I I also want to mix um, uh, fiction with the research. I also want to write fiction based uh, upon this non-fiction, this political research. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Lucas. I think me Lucas left, perhaps. Yeah. Um, then I think there's a couple more people. Um, 
Oh yeah, sure. Hi, Musim. Uh, yeah, uh, writer, researcher, um, lecturer. Uh, between science, technology, art, philosophy, and more recently, yeah, different, um, I guess, forms of media. Um, we've been making theory-driven uh, games, theatre productions, and uh, now focusing a bit more on, like, I guess, what you could say, pure theory fiction. Uh, so I'll be um, going on a little journey with you towards the end of the course, um, but I'm here also as a participant, as a peer. So yeah, looking forward to uh, sharing thoughts and ideas with you all. We also have uh, Georgiana. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Georgiana. I come from Romania. Um, and now I reside in Amsterdam and I'm a certificate student for the transdisciplinary studies path. Um, and I came to this course because I realized um, wanting to honor this way of practicing this mode of knowledge transdisciplinary requires also a special type of writing uh, that I found quite uh, challenging um, and but also very uh, appealing for me um, because I would say that uh, working in a transdisciplinary manner um, suits people who without clear frontiers uh, be them existential or even political um, and or who are forced out of contributing to knowledge. And it also kind of afforded me to integrate um, a bit of like personal space, but without confessing it as personal. Um, and I'm also here because I had a bit of difficulty with my little animal, so to speak. Um, because I started to take upon many writing um, courses to uh, overcome uh, this uh, myth of writer's block. But then I, I discovered basically a journey into my mind and I started a project called Morphic Mind that I also want to uh, express in a more lyrical manner. And um, I think in, uh, I don't know, in, in, psychotherapy it's referred more like the inner child but of course that's kind of a problem for me it's not really expressing um best and i'm so happy that uh or i i feel way more recognized by this little animal uh metaphor or image and i would like to become acquainted with it throughout this course and befriend it thank you And last is uh, Reza. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is Reza Argastani. Uh, I'm an architect, artist, and designer based on Los Angeles. And I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be with you all. And um, but the main thing that actually dragged me to First, I'm a uh, certificate student of a new center in uh, post planet, post planetary universal design, and um, and the thing that actually dragged me to enroll this particular class is uh, I've been a more than a visual person in each trade that I've been working on in architecture, in art, and in design. So. Uh, but I did a little bit of writing uh, in those three trades, and uh, I thought that uh, this course actually uh, could be so helpful and creative uh, in order to explain more or actually explore more. That's it. Thank you. Uh, great. So I think that's everyone, I believe. I don't know if I missed someone, but... Otherwise, I think probably we, should, we could go for the break and then maybe Ross and Gianna want to explain about how to 
yeah, moving to Discord and all this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves. That was it was so interesting to hear um, kind of where you're all based, also where you're all coming from in terms of your your practice as writers, as artists. Um, uh, Shona and I are definitely going to be listening back through all of those so we can take, I think, closer notes um, and kind of understand where all of your different interests and concentrations are. So yeah, we will go to the uh, the break in a moment. Um, but as Sean mentioned before, what we're doing, well, what what we kind of want to, you know, ideally use the break for is helping any of you who are not yet in the new center discords to be in there and to find your way to the place that we're going to be having the rest of the discussion um, after the break. So I've just put the link in the chat. Um, possibly no one needs it. I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that I'm just assuming that at least one person probably has not yet joined uh, or has been put off making a Discord profile or, or whatever. So anyway, first step, obviously, click on that link. Um, and if you need to, if you're starting absolutely from zero, set up a Discord profile, um, join, the, join the new center Discord. I don't remember whether there are any steps to go through before you can uh, kind of see all of the channels. Uh, if there are, then we'll be here to talk you through them if there's any kind of like, um, you know, confusion over that. And then basically, if I just quickly share my screen again, um, I'll show you where we're actually going to be talking. Hopefully you can see that. Um, So we're going to be in this channel here, the general channel of down here. Can you hopefully you can all see that there's this this category called writing the impossible object, which is underneath. So there's current seminars, which is where all of the usual uh, kind of group chat stuff happens, and then underneath it, <clears throat> hopefully you can see this bit that's called writing the impossible object that's got. General sharing work, breakout groups one, two, and three, reading group, and then a bunch of voice channels. So what we're going to do is we're going to be like the text chat aspect will be happening in general, just here, yeah, where Anna Olivia Plurabel is the uh, is the is the resident guardian, and we're going to be talking in the voice channel, also called general. Yeah, I'll put this in the chat. You know, so you, you've got that to refer back to. But that's basically your task now is to go into the, the new set of Discord. Oh, mute <laughs> mute your Discord um uh notifications, which I clearly haven't done for at least one of my Discord servers, because that was the sound that you you heard just then. Um and that if we don't all mute them, we will definitely get to be very sick of that sound in uh not too long. And then yeah, kind of like say hi in the general channel and join the uh, the general voice channel. So three simple steps. Um, yeah, so we will, I guess you, you can all leave Zoom if you want, um, but it might be better if you just stay on there until you're absolutely certain that you're in the Discord channel. Um, Shona, Alan and I will still be in the, uh, in the Zoom. You know, if you've got any questions, uh, just, just ask us basically. I see Reza's managed to get in there first uh, into the, the general channel, quickly followed by some other people now. So anyway, let's go for our break. Um, I guess let's try, let, maybe let's make it seven minutes rather than um, rather than 10, because we're running a little bit behind. Um, but uh, yeah, see you in there shortly. <laughs> 